And um, as the moderator, I don't really like that terminology moderator, but then being the moderator, I will try my best to facilitate this conversation. Um, I'll try to ensure that uh, I provide an equal opportunity for the participants as well as the panelists to bring uh, their thoughts on. And uh, I'll be guiding our discussions through this structured agenda that I have received from my dear colleagues. But uh, I really look forward for your participation to ensure this to be a very successful session. So um, to begin with the session, um, we will first go through uh, three important presentations. Um, one is introducing this uh, early one for all initiative to you all. And then we have another presentation looking at the IBM for Maldives under the SDG funded projects. And also we have one more presentation on escape trust fund for tsunami disaster and climate preparedness. So once the presentations are over, I'll be calling up for the panelists to join the panel, and then we'll start with the panel discussions as well. So the first presentation of the session uh, will actually look into the one of the key components of early morning for all initiative, which is impact-based forecasting. So um, basically moving from uh, letting people to know how the weather is, um, IBF is all about letting people know what the weather could do. So by shifting the focus from uh, meteorological data to the potential effects of society, impact-based forecasting actually improves the usability and relevance of weather information, ultimately helping individuals and organizations for better preparedness and respond to the weather conditions. So with the help of our international partners, we have been doing multiple works on our uh, implementing IP technologies, which one of these uh, project is actually uh, funded by SDG. So, um, I would like to welcome Ms. Kamya. Oh, you're here. <laughs> Who is not in your face for any of you now? So uh, she'll be briefing you on this um, SDG funded project on idea for Maldives. Thank you. Thank you, Parusha, and uh, good morning to uh, all of you. Uh, welcome to the uh, session on early warning. Uh, it's uh, it going to be a very uh, interesting and engaging session. Uh, you know, the panel we have, uh, like Parusha was mentioning. So I will go through some of the work we have done as part of the SDG project. Uh, on the first day, we only uh, demonstrated the part which was basically on climate projection, but we also have a aspect of you know establishing methodology for impact and forecasting in models. Uh, looking at the localized uh, impacts of disaster and how to uh, for the online no, okay. uh, looking at the uh, local uh, disasters or weather events, uh, extreme events. Um, so we I'll go through some of the uh, results that we have got. And uh, just to begin with that, uh, like Parusha was mentioning, impact based based forecasting is uh, all about you know how the weather, what the weather can do. It just tells us and where it might be, you know, impacted more, which population we might, might be impacted more, where are the vulnerabilities and all. And uh, it has a very uh, significant connection with the early warning for all because uh, it gives us the opportunity to minimize the socioeconomic cost of uh, weather and climate events. Next slide. So just to begin with what impact-based forecasting means, uh, it's actually uh, uh, and how we can you know, extract information from uh, the uh, relevant information to know what the weather can do. Uh, we have the weather, weather analysis or the forecast data, and then we extract the information which are relevant uh, for the sectors, for the, for the countries, uh, uh, from the weather data and then translate it to the impact estimation for different relevant sectors. And uh, then we can you know, look into the mitigation strategies of preparedness uh, based on the type of disasters and then the population it might affect or the sector, sector it might affect. Next slide. So there are different types of phases or uh, you know, based on the time scale of the forecast, uh, uh, impact, impact based forecasting can be done. Uh, on the first day, we talked about long-term decisions, uh, which was based on climate projections and which you know that spans for years and uh, decades. Uh, but also, uh, it can it can be done for uh, different you know uh, time period, like for three to six months, where we work on the seasonal predictions of uh, particular seasons, for the, uh, pertinent to the countries, and uh, which is very useful for strategic decision for the upcoming seasons and. Uh, potential uh, hazards 
And then we also have uh, uh, weather forecasts as well, which are very short term uh, phenomena. And uh, we can also be uh, used uh, the, the, the data, the forecast for impact risk forecast for short term phenomena like you know, cyclones or uh, uh, sea swells, for example, for the for the bodies. So, uh, so for uh, uh, Maldives, we have done uh, three types of impact based forecasting, uh, seasonal output motion, music motion wind model, and cycle forecast data. I will cite two examples for, for the first two, uh, first two uh, work we have done. Yes. So this was the seasonal forecast. The left side, uh, the left most, most, the first one on the left, it shows the seasonal forecast for June, July, August, September uh, 2023 for Maldives. Uh, this data we uh, received from uh, SASCOM, which is uh, a forum for seasonal output um, uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, so uh, it says that you know the northern part of the northern to central part of the island, they have uh, the probability of uh, above normal precipitation, and there are different probability scales with the tension being here. Uh, like 40 to 50 percent, some I, some adults might, uh, you know, uh, there are about, about, uh, about 50 percent of probability of uh, having above normal precipitation, and some other have around 50 to 60 percent. Uh, and again, if you go to the southern part of uh, central to southern part of the country, there are, you know, there are probability of below normal precipitation, and the probability changes across different uh, islands and adults. So, we uh, Try to look into the uh, past uh, 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 drought or you know water shortage or flood rain, rainwater related flood phenomena and try to you know uh, convert this new information to find out the most vulnerable areas where which are already prone to flood uh, related to rainwater or already prone to you know uh, water scarcity situation and uh, and then they do and uh, do a you know in depth analysis on particularly those areas which which islands are are going to be uh, most affected. Uh, so here, uh, yeah, as I can see, uh, uh, I was telling that uh, the northern islands, which has the, you know, they need more attention uh, in terms of about normal precipitation, and then if you go to the southern side, uh, southern side, which is uh, below normal precipitation. The next one, please. So using that data and the uh, greater population data we have. Uh, we uh, try to identify the, uh, the islands which has more population and which might be exposed to uh, you know, normal precipitation. So, as you can see in the in the in the data uh, as well as in the map, some of the islands uh, where there are lots of you know the population number is higher, they might face uh, you know, normal precipitation. And then um, it depends on uh, the uh, normal respiration of different skills. And there are more probability among the uh, islands here, here, and then a bit less probability uh, uh, on the islands here. And there are uh, many islands which are really have a higher number of population. Uh, they can be, they, they might be exposed to uh, this kind of, you know, this precipitation. And it is, it is uh, very important for the agricultural sector uh, because uh, as we know that the agriculture here is mainly based on uh, rainwater, depends on rainwater, there is not much groundwater uh, for irrigation and all. And uh, many of the islands where the, their their likelihood of below you normal know, precipitation have agricultural area which contribute to the you know uh, country uh, demand uh, might face you know less uh, precipitation below you normal know, precipitation and accordingly uh, the agricultural area might be impacted. Similarly, we have done the same uh, uh, analysis with uh, about normal precipitation. And it might lead to, you know, water logging or plant life situation, especially in the cities where there are different, I mean, uh, like Mar area already seen that in last flood, uh, what it can do, the about normal precipitation or sudden increase in precipitation, what it can do can actually create like flood life situation in different parts of the city. Um, so this, this, this information is really important to have kind of, you know, preparedness. 
to have this information in advance uh, gives us quite you know uh, time to get ready for the you know upcoming potential impacts of the population as well as we can do it the same thing in, in agriculture uh, in terms of uh, you know many islands that that has a, a large number large area under uh, uh, agriculture i i know this island which is uh, the which, which produce lots of vegetables and uh, fruits uh, for the uh, Maldives. Uh, unlike it, 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 this island, it's uh, likely to get more precipitation under the seasonal outlook. And the seasonal outlook they, they provide us every year. So we can do the analysis based on the new data. And uh, you know, uh, we can see the changes and we can uh, see the impacted area in advance. Next. Also, uh, like the elevation data we have, um, using the elevation data, we can identify the you know low lying areas and converge with, with the you know uh, the, the areas which are going to which are likely to get more precipitation, and then we can identify where uh, you know water life condition or flood might happen, and where uh, we need to be more concerned about you know giving the service to people uh, how to you know, uh, get out of the the, the water life condition or the flood like situation. And uh, yeah, uh, another very interesting uh, data sets we have received from all these measures, uh, services, uh, which is the ocean wave model data. They receive this data um, every every four hours, get refreshed. It gives, gives, gives us uh, different parameters, as you can see, there are 50 parameters, uh, 30 parameters they received. Uh, we work with one parameter, which is sea surface uh, uh, wave height, significant wave height. And uh, uh, they also give the direction as well as uh, 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 direction, uh, the, the wave direction. We work with the significant wave height. And uh, this data is quite uh, high resolution and uh, it refreshes every, refreshes every four uh, days. And it is really useful for operational decisions uh, in terms of uh, pertinent sectors like you know, agriculture or fisheries uh, uh, and, and also emergency responses as well. So based on this data, uh, uh, it can be identified uh, which areas are going to receive, you know, they, they are likely to receive uh, waves, which are a bit higher. So the wave height here ranges from 0.3 meter to more than, more than two meters. And uh, as we could see that, you know, many areas here and here, uh, they're likely to get, uh, uh, this is the wave height. The wave height is going to be uh, around more than uh, two meters, and uh, there are many inhabited islands, uh, you know, which did not uh, have the uh, Tinabiyane at all. They are likely to experience more than two meters, and the northern atolls, uh, they are uh, many islands are going to receive um, the experience 1.52 meter high waves. And let me see what we can do with this information. So again, we use the elevation data um, and we see how the agricultural area might get affected in, in here. So we have categorized the areas into three categories, areas where wave height is up to one meter, then up to two meters, then up to two, uh, more than two meters to uh, actually show the, uh, show the uh, impact. And uh, there are many agricultural areas you can see. Uh, we were, we were uh, traveling to Ganatol, and then um, we could see, you know, uh, there were many uh, banana fields uh, uh, which are uh, flooded, uh, and then the, the, plant, the farms got destroyed. All the um, uh, plants are like, you know, yellow, has become yellow, and the crops are destroyed. So uh, I think this kind of information, uh, okay, this is urban areas. Uh, uh, in urban areas also, if we use the elevation, uh, I was showing that these areas are going to get uh, higher waves than the other areas. So there are many areas where we just, we just um, low lying. And also we can uh, you know, include the critical infrastructure I was talking about uh, on the first day uh, to know the exposure of uh, different critical infrastructure as well as the urban areas uh, and to see the uh, potential impact on those areas. And similarly, on the agricultural uh, areas as well, same uh, analysis we have done. 
uh, to see what are, what are the kind of impacts and then we can also identify the area exposed uh, to um, in, in different islands and then prioritize our uh, responses. Uh, yes, uh, the critical infrastructure as well. Uh, uh, there are energy infrastructure, health and educational uh, infrastructure. Uh, many, many areas there lie, you know, there are the low lying areas uh, which might get impacted uh, during, uh, during this kind of high wave spatial reactions. Here, they are you know, located uh, very near to the coast, and uh, for example, this one as well. Uh, and then uh, swells might uh, get. Uh, you know, make this area flooded or uh, impact those uh, infrastructure uh, bad. Next one. Uh, we can even go to the island level and see what are the infrastructure. The database is very detailed. Uh, even go to the uh, you know, island level and see what are the, you know, type of physical critical infrastructure which are exposed and uh, exactly which are the critical infrastructure which are exposed. So it's very, uh, you know, Detailed information that can uh, help us in, in, in preparedness as well as responses. Another uh, interesting uh, data that we got from fisheries department is the fishing locations. So uh, we all know that fishing uh, industry uh, is very important for long leaves and uh, we could see that there's, there are several fish uh, aggregating devices located uh, around uh, long leaves. And uh, for, uh, the fishing uh, for fishermen, they generally go near those areas to get uh, fishes. So any high waves condition uh, might lead to uh, uh, exposure of the fishermen to high waves and uh, might lead to you know uh, death or something. Uh, so we also can uh, you know identify the areas which are, uh, the fishing devices which might be exposed to different uh, you know wave heights, so that it can be. Uh, uh, the information can be disseminated to the uh, to the fishermen and uh, proper you know uh, preparedness or uh, responses can be taken care of. I think I will uh, finish here and uh, uh, and would like to listen more about uh, how impact is forecasting can lead to early warning and uh, uh, how this information can be useful for the country. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I will have to answer. Uh, thank you, Kumio, for the very interesting uh, presentations. We actually had, had uh, one session yesterday, I think, if I'm not wrong, on the ninth session uh, about translating these uh, kind of important things uh, into a uh, policy election. So uh, I am actually very positive. Um, by using this data, we can actually bring the change to the work that we are currently doing. Uh, moving on to the next uh, presentation, we have uh, a presentation introducing us to early voting for all, which will be uh, given by uh, Mr. Harold Rice and uh, Ahmed Fiza, who is our DRR and CCA um, national consultant. And I, I would actually like to Take this opportunity to uh, thank you, UNDR, especially Pisa, for um, his hard work that has been done on uh, developing this uh, roadmap for early voting for all. And uh, we take the pride saying that we have been the first uh, country in the region to um, actually start the early voting for all initiatives. So um, thank you very much, Pisa, for all your hard work and UNDR for your support as well. So, yes, the first year. Thanks for sharing. Good morning, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll be quick and just give a little bit of, uh, you know, information on the sort of global structure of this, and then I'll hand over to Giselle to give the much more interesting dynamics of what happened here in Maldives and, and where we go from here. So the Early Warning for All initiative is an initiative by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, to cover, uh, can you go to the next slide too, actually, to cover all people by 2027. Uh, with early warning systems, and the, the sort of idea behind those is that they're multi-hazards, and many countries obviously think focus on one particular hazard, the one in which would most impact them, so making sure that it's inclusive of all hazards, end-to-end, -end, meaning that the end users are able to, and I've heard some good conversations around end-to-end-to-end, -to -end -to -end. so the ability of the end user to be able to give feedback to the system to say, okay, it's working or not working for me, and then, you know, change the system. 
And then finally, people centered. So making sure that warnings are actionable and people understand how to use them and, and what the information actually means to them. Because if someone tells you, oh, there's a level four cyclone coming to your house, does that tell you anything what to do or you know, how to act in that sense? Next slide, please. So the, the initiative has four pillars, which is all we'll get into a bit more what that looks like here in Maldives, but essentially, and these have been covered a, a few times over the course of the day, so I'll just quickly run through disaster risk knowledge, sort of, you know, not only about the, the knowledge of risk, like the RRD, but also loss and damage data to understand previous impacts of disaster events. Detection, observation, forecasting, this is falling mostly in the hydromet space, and that impact-based forecasting is sort of a link between pillars one and two, and I would say the RRP is also a strong link between pillars one and two. Three, on dissemination and communication, I think sort of two parts to this. One is the infrastructure to be able to communicate to the islands. But the other part is, what are the actual messages that are being sent? Are they sent in local language? Are they sent to be understood by the communities based on where they're coming from? And then finally, preparedness and uh, response capabilities. And then the last slide for me. So then just to give some sort of background of what this looks like at the global level, essentially there is a lead for each of the pillars and then a variety of entities who, who would participate to it, providing technical guidance. But as Fizal will highlight, in, in countries and in Maldives, there's, you know, it's obviously going to be a government-led process. And so these are just meant to be technical support for them. So my agency, UNDR, mm -hmm. is on Pillar 1, the World Meteorological Organization on Pillar 2, ITU, the Internet, International Telecommunications Union on Pillar 3, and the IFRC on Pillar 4. And you'll see similarly reflected in what's here in Maldives. So with that, I'll pass to Fizal. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Harold, and thanks, Farusha, for the kind words. Uh, obviously, this would have been, wouldn't have been uh, completed without the hard work of um, many of the other leads I can see here. And um, I would say, uh, next slide. I would say, um, you know, in one form or the other, early warning systems actually existed in this, even before. Uh, we had this. Very sophisticated Nakai system for Iwa and Monaco of both uh, seasons. Uh, 13 days each, uh, more throughout the year. Uh, very much representing um, what was going on every year. It was a scientific method. Uh, we don't call it a scientific method now, but um, it was a scientific method for those days, uh, based on you know how observation and replication and how things happen. And I would say. Um, was a very much a scientific method for those times. So um, the early morning poll conversation started I think around um, 2015. Um, in when, when the Sendai framework was being signed, Japan actually brought this up um, in Sendai, and the emphasis was um, played throughout by Japan. And the conversation went on and on for a while. And in COP26, it was initially to be held in 2020, but because of COVID, it was 2021. Um, it was finally launched. Um, uh, and, and from there on, um, we, you know, Maldives has been one of the first countries to actually launch the, uh, uh, the roadmap. So, we have four pillars, like Harold just mentioned uh, disaster risk knowledge. Uh, um, detection, observation, monitoring, and analysis. With the three um, warning, dissemination, communication. So it's the full cycle that goes, um, like I Carol mentioned, end to end, making sure that it reaches the uh, last person, last last mile as well, and also ensuring it's multi-hands. So um, there are four agencies leading the four head. Um, Four pillars in Maldives and NDA may Parusha actually is the lead, the lead person from NDA may lead to that the pillar one was also very um, helpful to support me investigating it. Due credit for her. Um, then there's the pillar two MMS. Uh, Ahmad is here, um, and lead of pillar two was, I uh, think, one of the very first people who responded, I mean, who actually completed the. Um, the roadmap. And then pillar three um, used to be NCIT, but now it's um, 
Ministry of Homeland Security and um, Technology. That's right. Um, Sharif was the uh, lead for that. Uh, it's not here, but um, yeah, much conversation happened um, back and forth. Over it. And finally, Pila for um, I think Shamil was supposed to be here, but um, uh, all your present who are leading the pillar, not just from Yale, um, but all the all agency, the input from everyone um, contributed <coughs> to the whole um, program. So the idea of this presentation, I thought, wasn't just you know show the roadmap. I thought maybe you you can of course I can give a link and have a look at the roadmap. Uh, the thing you wouldn't know is how we went we came up with the roadmap. Um, by looking at the document, you wouldn't know that. So I thought presenting that would be better. So I'll go through the process a little bit, how we went through. Uh, so initially it was really helpful to have this uh, gap analysis uh, done at the beginning. If many of you uh, participated in the July workshop, we are a very, very well um, guided gap analysis as in having many questions around what was necessary, what were the needs and necessities. Um, oftentimes, uh, not just the government colleagues, even the private sector, it needs a bit of a direction um, in terms of um, getting to have something complete. Um, questions often guide you towards, do you have this, do you have that regulation, do you have this equipment? Uh, this sort of guidance to And in the end, you are actually identifying the gaps yourself. And there are some um, limitations to that as well, um, which we will go through in the next. So overall, the gap analysis was really um, you know, helpful to begin um, the, the, the process and uh, to ensure that we led on, led on to the, the formulation of the roadmap, because um, the, roadmap was the objectives of the roadmap the, and the activities actually flow from the gaps. So need, objective, activities, positive, all included in there. So the other thing was uh, the budgets needed, a lot of research. Uh, for example, um, in the case of the plant office, I would say there were a lot of new technologies which were required. Uh, and it was a bit difficult to just say in a meeting, this is that this amount of figure is needed for this technology and that. So it required a lot of time from the staff uh, station at, 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 the, at the agency. It's not just meant to be at the NCIP, at MRC, and also at the um, NDMA. So this is for some um, limitation. We also put in, of course, the budgets and the stock take of existing projects, uh, which, which we included. So. This was obviously very important because we didn't want um, duplication of that. Yeah, yeah I've already mentioned some of the key challenges. Uh, some uh, in institutions mentioned that uh, initially there was some um, difficulty in um, getting the information, but it was, it, you know, Sometimes it felt like there was a need for another staff to be hired to actually do the research for each organization. And that is clearly understood. I mean, this is because the amount of work each and every agency does, and on top of this, all of a sudden, something also new come, comes in and it requires and demands a lot of work. And, and somewhat, we still got the agencies to do this and really grateful that everyone cooperated and we were eventually able to do it. Uh, limited local research into objectives and activities. Yeah, so um, some, for example, some of the equipment um, that's been listed um, haven't ever been used in Maldives before. Uh, some of them had to be consulted with um, European agencies where they are actually using this, some of them being used in um, Eastern Asia countries as well, who were contacted, who were you know, inquired about um, regarding the price of these equipment and also usability and maintenance. So to do a costing, a proper costing, um, all 
this research um, was needed. And of course, with that research comes more time that's required as well. So that's another um, major setback we had to face. But even with that, um, the agencies were very efficient, I would say, um, to provide this. So my task basically was to go back and forth um, with each agency, making sure that you know this is completed by the time we reached um, all is reached actually uh, the COP twenty eight in November. Um, so um, Catherine had in, had had this um, priority in mind to ensure that this gets done. I mean, there, there needs to be someone and. We have to give credit to her. Um, there needs to be someone reminding of a deadline that, that it needed to be done. And um, it was a priority to get this done by COP28. And I would give that train as well uh, the credits credit for that. And yeah, we did complete it. And yeah, like I mentioned, time was a constraint to do this by COP28. We had to rush a little bit, which is a key challenge, um, key limitation. Um, when you rush things, it's not, not perfect, far, far from perfect, but um, yeah, we get we've all, I mean, not just me, all of you guys as well, uh, given the best effort, and we were able to um, publish this and uh, the, you know, in, in, it's been endorsed by the ministry and published on the ministry's website uh, January 15. So, yeah, that's the short version of my presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Isal and Harold. Uh, I believe our participants actually have a lot of questions regarding this initiative. But then, uh, saving those questions for the uh, panel discussions, we have one more presentation that's uh, coming up. Uh, we have Tamily who's uh, joining us online. Um, she will be giving us a brief on the UNSF. Press point for tsunami disaster and climate preparedness. Hi, Tamale, the floor is yours. Hello, good to see you again. Can you hear me okay? If I um, cut out at any stage, I'll just turn my video off. Um, I hope you can hear me fine and, and I'll just sh share my screen. I hope you can see my slides and hear me okay. Um, but yes, my name is Temily. I'm representing UNSCAP, but I have the, the pleasure and privilege to manage our multi-donor trust fund for tsunami disaster and climate preparedness. Um, you know, we've we've just heard from our colleagues in UNDRR, and I think everyone in the room knows that, you know, early warning is nothing new uh, for Maldives. This roadmap is not starting from scratch. Um, this is not a, a zero point, but it is built on a long, long history of uh, quite impressive commitment and leadership uh, from your national pillar leads to really advance your early warning systems across the country. Um, so for us, at least, we've been working together uh, with Maldives for, for some time. But just to illustrate this uh, mechanism, um, the Trust Fund was established in 2005, uh, triggered by uh, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, you know, the government of Thailand uh, really formed this multi-donor trust fund uh, with a two, $10, billion, $10 million investment. And this really then was fueled by a regional commitment uh, to address uh, shared hazards uh, with shared early warning systems. Um, so it aims to enhance our disaster preparedness through cooperation um, together. So the main pillars you can see on the screen uh, here is really around strengthening multi-hazard early warning systems uh, for our broader social economic resilience of the region. It's, like I said, through regional cooperation and, and then lastly by mentioning technology and innovation. Um, yeah, I'd just like to also thank our, our current donors and previous donors and all of our implementing partners, many who are well, with you there today and we've already heard from. 
um, in the previous session. Uh, yesterday, I know Rans was also here. But what does this um, really mean uh, to Maldives or to early warning parole? Um, here we can see we've broken down the last 19 years of support uh, through the trust fund in each of those four pillars and we can see that there's quite sp uh, spread uh, well across all pillars, uh, around $16 million worth of investments. And um, let me, I'm excited to show you some photos of the last, um, some of the, the old projects that we've done together. Uh, with your country. So since 2007, uh, we've worked together on 11 projects. Uh, some of these helped form um, some of your national action plans for disaster risk reduction a while ago. You might have also seen the documentary, The Wave That Shook the World. Um, I know that the, the Maldives Broadcasting Centre aired this when um, it was the 10th anniversary of the Indian Ocean tsunami. Um, you know, we've worked together with ITU, the pillar lead for the third pillar um, on common alerting protocol, um, as well as uh, through your membership at the panel on tropical cyclones to work on synergized energy object operating procedures. Um, but really one of the main um, the main achievements that we've been able to, to see together um, with thanks to the Maldives Met Service is this establishment of the regional integrated early warning system uh, for Asia and Africa. Um, that's RIMES, um, which Maldives Met Service is the, the secretariat to. You know, in, in the early days, um, there was only just a small handful of countries who are a member of RIMES. Now, um, that bottom left uh, photo is us at the, uh, the most recent RIMES Council meeting, and they're supporting 48 member and collaborating countries, which is such an achievement um, to see uh, that your country is, is leading in this area, um, not only um, across your atolls, but also across the region. Um, you can also see here uh, the commitment to impact-based forecasting and improving the accuracy of seasonal forecasts and sector contributions um, through your journey in monsoon forums that's already been raised a couple of times. Um, over the last few days in that middle bottom photo is the very first monsoon forum um, for Maldives. Um, so we've been really pleased to be able to journey with you, with you um, across all of these. Um, I just wanted to, to congratulate you with, on that and, and just am proud that some of the work that we have done together has really sustained and we can see it so feeds into your roadmap that you have today. But coming back to, um, I guess, Maldives leadership as well across the region um, and when we think about early warnings for all I wanted to highlight the mandate and the commitment of the Commission uh, for Asia and the Pacific. Um, so as one of the regional commissions, um, member states of Asia and the Pacific passed resolution 79-1 um, last year in May and this was really spearheaded by Maldives together with Fiji, and they said that we would accelerate climate action for sustainable development. And one of the main priorities of how we would do this would be to develop early warning systems at the regional level. So the roadmap is national focus, but I want to also highlight that there is this regional level focus as well that Maldives has been able to lead on at the political level. Now, Zooming a bit in, the Committee on Disaster Risk Reduction um, then said, OK, let's take this resolution and how can this be implemented? And they said, um, you know, through SCAP, we need to develop and implement a regional strategy on early warnings for all. And I've included some of the photos here from the committee um, and from the commission. These are really points in time when your ministers, your ministers of state and key officials have have really changed the course of the discussions at the regional level um, and spoken on behalf of SIDS for early warning systems and for early warning systems that meet transboundary needs. The next steps of, of this, I guess, regional commitment was then requesting support to build national capacity by leveraging innovations including digital and geospatial applications for early warning systems. I think we've talked a lot, a lot about this point, um, specifically in the last few days. The disaster, um, the SCAP Risk and Resilience Portal is a really key product of SCAP um, that falls under this 
um, key points. And um, Maldives, we've been learning a lot from your experience using and downscaling this portal um, in support of, of the wider region. And then the last point was encouraging member states to contribute to and utilise the SCAP Trust Fund to help achieve and implement this regional strategy on early warnings for all. So here you can also see um, your permanent representatives to SCAP as well as um, Ms Ali Sharif there um, inputting into some of those key strategic discussion points that have paved the way to how the trust fund can help respond and support countries when it comes to this early morning fuel initiative and what is the role that we can play together to create a real sustainable uh, regional ecosystem for early warning systems that really do meet the needs and are fit for purpose, especially when it comes to transboundary hazards. Um, so what does this regional strategy look like? Here you can see a lot of our thinking on one slide, but essentially it comes down to um, that first point of what are the under how do we understand the risks and vulnerabilities that exist in our world today and are expected to evolve? And then asking ourselves the questions, are early warning systems accessible? Are they available and are they effective um, to meet the needs of the exposures that we've uncovered? And then we have to understand the complexities around transboundary origins of, and impacts of some of these multi-hazard risks. You have tropical cyclones that track way across different subregions. You have tsunami waves that are triggered from a fault line all the way across the ocean basin that then affect your islands. We have to understand the transboundary origins and the exposure of these risks to our populations and, and, and livelihoods. So often that will involve that last cog in the wheel. What is that transboundary early warning system at the regional and sub-regional level? How can we build something that is fit for purpose, um, that also takes into account your context in the broader region and ocean basin. So really, these are the, our uh, key points here is what is that is risk? What are those expected impacts? How is that going to affect your population and your sectors? How will they be exposed? And what are the existing early warning system capacities that you have? that exists today and that checklist that we will work through together during that workshop was such an important opportunity to take stock, not only of the gaps and, and form the roadmap, but also take stock and see how far that we have come together for your early warning system. And then obviously we can fill in those gaps and look at the opportunities to work together and also work together with neighbouring countries to fill those gaps. Um, but just to finish off, I did want to highlight um, an exciting opportunity that is underway right now. Of course, you are aware that the end of this year will be marking 20 years on since the Indian Ocean tsunami. So uh, for this year, many uh, UN agencies and even yourself are working on ways to commemorate um, this really important uh, day. For us at the Trust Fund, we've been able to commission um, an Indian Ocean tsunami-wide tsunami preparedness capacity assessment. So working with UNESCO IOC through the IOTWMS, so the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning System, of which MMS is, is a member, to look at what are the technical capacities and tsunami warning system now, and then what are the gaps to move forward. So we hope to see how far we have come since 2004, both nationally and as a region, as a whole ocean basin. And from here, we'll be able to see well, what are these gaps um, what and what are the capacity development requirements. So I'm really looking forward to um, obviously working with MMS on these national surveys, which will come out very soon on this, um, but also sharing some of the findings to celebrate together the progress and hard work that we have made to really close a lot of these tsunami warning gaps, um, but also look into the future and how best we can equip our early warning systems to truly be multi-hazard focused and also seek the benefits of working together with our, our neighbours around the region and around the ocean basin. Um, and that's all from me. Um, I know that uh, my colleague, Dr. Sanjay Shvastava, is online as well to join the panel. So if you have any questions, I'm sure he will be able to 
uh, health answer as well. But thank you so much for having me. So I can see the presenting game. Um, next, we have uh, our Minister of State uh, for Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Welfare, Ms. Uh, Mariam Vishama. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Munashi, Director of Ecology from the Moines Physiological Services. Uh, Mr. Result, National Consultant for the RR and CPA for the RR. And uh, Mr. Mohamed Azam. Environment and this from Mr. Climate Change and Environment. Um, we missed one of our panelists, Mr. Shamil uh, from MRC. I'm sure there, there should be some kind of emergency that he could not make it to the panel today. Yeah, so um, welcome, welcome to the session. Uh, before we begin with the panel discussion, let me again remind you all that uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions and uh, give insights to this panel. Uh, and for those who are joining online, I can see we have like 15 participants online. So um, you could always uh, post a question in the chat, which I believe that uh, would help to bring them to the panel. So just feel free to uh, post any question or any suggestion, comments, or insights that you have in the uh, chat as well. So um, to begin with this panel, um, we'll start with a short presentation, I believe from our Moritz Regional Health Services, um, Mr. Ahmad. Ahmad will be uh, sharing the current status of the project and uh, some of the um, other things ongoing in terms of early morning, right? So yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for, for uh, uh, allocating this my panel time to give a brief overview of our existing capacity and ongoing activities and also the, uh, some of the activities that are planned ahead. Uh, in this session, I will be mostly highlighting on as uh, either two lead of MMS uh, observation forecasting uh, activities. Uh, in this moment. In the observation and forecasting capacity, currently we have established uh, a network of observation across the countries consisting of five main observatories that is monitored 24 hour basis. And additionally, to fill these gaps because the uh, weather phenomena are highly variable and it is, uh, it is not able to capture all the events with these five stations, we have established automatic weather stations. Almost 42 automatic weather stations have been established, uh, and one radio sonder that is observing uh, upper atmosphere over the southern area, and one Doppler weather radar covering almost uh, 40, 40 to 50 percent in the central Maldives, and also three tide gauges and satellite receiving systems. So these observations are actually not sufficient uh, to power uh, the existing requirements for global requirements. I mean, even uh, local observation is not sufficient, so we need the additional observations even to incorporate from the surrounding areas and lo local centers. So we are uh, we are improving our observation capacity to come com in, in compliance with the global uh, G1 global basic observation network. So that will be done on the soft initiatives. Uh, currently, our early warning dissemination mechanism is mostly through uh, social media platforms. We have a viber community group for 36,000 plus members. And also, our uh, early warning uh, message alerts are in, compl in compliance with common alerting protocol. So, once we issue an alert, it can be adapted to any technologies, your mobile phones, TV, radios, 
in one file and can be activated uh, with these fields. We have we are also using mobile app, mobile app for Android and uh, iOS and Twitter, Facebook. Next. Uh, some of the innovation technologies that we are working on to develop is early warning broadcasting broadcasting system. It's a Japanese technology. We are working with NDMA, MMS, and public service media. Uh, once we issue an alert, the TVs will be activated with the alert message. When TV is off, if the power is on with the uh, with the modem, then uh, TV automatically will put on the alarm when once. Uh, elaborate the show. Uh, another one that I mentioned, we are in com we are, our alerts are uh, common alerting protocol compliant. So these alerts are even now taken by other agencies, like the example shown here, whether one is that is an alert we issued, but it was displayed in uh, uh, wind here. So anyone uh, can grab our alerts and display in the format that they are required. So it is taken from uh, WMO alert hub. So once we issue an alert, it will be uh, populated in a WMO alert hub. So anyone can take those. So other technologies that we are thinking of is just to introduce in channel broadcasting, which has been used in most developed countries. Now you may see that a lot of messages come into your mobile alert wide. But once we issue uh, implement cell broadcasting, only the alert will reach to the concerned communities. Uh, a person in the southern networks will not get alert issued to other networks. So we don't feel a lot of alerts coming into our mobile. Next. Uh, this is an example of contribution of early warning to crisis response and preparation. Uh, preparedness mechanism. So I, I have taken just two examples of the last two uh, heavy rainfall events, how we cooperated with the first responders, especially to NDMA. So for the 31st event, we issued, uh, we were issuing uh, forecast plus alerts, white alerts, yellow and orange on time. And these are the observations that we faced in for the 12th December, uh, uh, 12th January event, we have issued warnings three days ahead. Uh, it was written in given, so I will just say that uh, there was a tropical depression uh, in the next. So these are the examples. I mean, the actual, we issued the alert on 9th, so 10th and 12th, we received the uh, rainfall of the event. So these were well coordinated by first responders, but since uh, it had rained heavily, uh, the flood dam damage was caused, but uh, the, the response was very good and coordination by NDMA and concerned agencies were taken very well. Next. Uh, under this SDG project that, that you have worked on hands-on sessions, we were able to incorporate those uh, uh, risk and resident portal to our weather um, all these metro service weather web page. So anyone visiting our website also will be able to interact with this uh, platform. So that is one of the achievements through this SDG project that we, we collaborated with the project team. And another one, next slide. Another one we work with this is our objective of uh, conveying the message or simplifying the language is through monsoon forum. So we got assistance from this uh, project, uh, SDG project team to conduct monsoon forums in the law method. And additionally, we also conduct awareness sessions to school, college, and uh, students. And uh, the other ongoing activities, uh, we are one of the First 27 countries getting support on the soft initiatives, that is systematic observation financing. So with this project, we, we will get assistance to upgrade our existing observation networks to G1, uh, uh, G1 compliance, global basic observation network compliance. That's it. So we are upgrading both stations in the north 
Uh, additionally, one more station will be coming in the Mahapur because there is much space between uh, Animado and Mulunde. So to fill that gap, Mahapur station will be uh, coming under. So also upper air observation of the networks will be uh, great. Another ongoing project is uh, under USAID Climate Adaptation Project. This is to demonstrate uh, impact based forecasting modeling in Maldives. As SDG project has also initiated some activities, but through this project, our main objective is to increase our computation result, computation modeling capacity so that we get higher resolution model products to incorporate into what already exists uh, when the SDG project is done. So it is an add on layer to what has been done. So we will increase the resolution of our model uh, by increasing uh, uh, high performance computing system and modest mental results. Uh, another upcoming event that we have one radar, but to cover more full area, full Maldives area, we need additional two radars. So we are getting assistance from uh, Asian Development Bank and Government of Italy to increase our observation network to cover full Maldives area. So once it is covered, all these things are contributing towards uh, the one for all initiatives to implement in Maldives. Next. The another ongoing activity, not ongoing, but it's a TCO project we have started uh, since long time, maybe almost five years. But due to inter due to this new initiative of early warning for all, and Maldives is one of the 30 countries to get assistance to early warning for all. So this get boosted. Uh, I mean, in the fast track mode to uh, process. Uh, the project is called Towards Risk Aware and Climate Resilient Community. We call it TRAC. Initial objectives we realigned re with the UNAP GCO TRAC to cater many of the gaps and activities identified by the Pilaris in early warning for So, for example, if we take for PILA 1, disaster risk knowledge, the TRAC project will help, help uh, to reduce dynamic. Uh, to produce dynamic multi hazard maps and operationalize Maldives disaster loss and database. For pillar two, observation and forecasting, the track project will deploy ocean monitoring equipment and strengthen capacity of localist and WP modeling and impact based forecasting. For pillar three, warning disseminations, the track project will establish central multi hazard early warning system platform and help to make communications more inclusive and accessible to all populations group. For either for preparedness and response, the track project will help scale up community-based disaster risk reduction and develop early action protocols. In, in short, the track project is designed to complement and build on existing capacities and initiatives such as UNDP and the joint SDG project. So it is not going to introduce new things but to build on what is already being done thank you for my time on, on as a panelist thank you thank you Ahmad. I'll be officially moving to the moderator's table and I'll uh, keep this mind with you guys so that the online participants can enjoy the year and I am sure that I am audible to all of you right thank you Um, so, we'll officially begin the uh, panel discussion on the early one for all the initiatives. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, one of our panelists, we hope to see you. Yes. So, uh, we we'll begin the panel discussion. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Sanjay, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I can. So, um, again, before we start, let me remind you all that feel free to raise your hand and uh, bring out any questions that you have or any you want to add to the uh, conversation. Please, please feel free to do so so that we can have an engaging 
how you look open a discussion rather than having one way from here. Okay. So uh, to begin with, um, as highlighted by the presentation from Gerald uh, and Kiza, uh, after the call for global effort to ensure that the warning systems protect everyone on Earth by 2027, the UN Secretary General uh, in 2022 started the Early Warning uh, Initiative with, three, uh, with the aim on guaranteeing protection of everyone worldwide from hazardous events. Uh, so, but as Fizal mentioned that even before this initiative, there has been uh, multiple efforts put on both nationally and internationally to strengthen early warning mechanisms across the countries. So um, to begin with the panel discussion, I would like our esteemed panelists to share your thoughts based on your experiences on how do early warnings benefit different sectors. I can see we have uh, different sectors uh, here. So um, how do early warnings benefit different sectors in crisis response and preparedness. Maybe uh, bring up some examples of successful uh, outcomes resulting from timely early warning for the specific sectors. Uh, it's a very important question. Um, we have, um, I think I'll start with the key major sector in the Maldives, the tourism sector, um, which um, in the past several interventions from the back office um, have actually um, given them enough response time and uh, it has been effectively implemented to carry uh, out good interventions. Um, now, can I ask the online participants uh, if anybody else has their uh, system on to make sure it's just muted? So um, we we heard um, we, we come across uh, situations where um, you know, weather situations where strong uh, regions of Maldives have impacted areas to the point where um, you know resorts were notified in advance. And steps were taken to ensure that you know the tourists were safe. And often um, these don't get into the mass media because of the uh, tourism um, um, image of all this. But uh, there were several um, instances where these were applied uh, from um, from morning reception to the you know um, ensuring that the tourist at the end you know tourists at the resort were given these warnings and um, they were they were called and they were taken to to a safer area of the island. To give you a very specific example um, in, in this um, in resort of north north of Maldives, I would say um, there was this one time where the uh, the uh, warning was given by the bank office and I if I remember correctly this was in um, um, I think around 2015 or 17, around that time. Uh, because of that warning, I think it was it was really able for the uh, resort owners to ensure that the guests were safe. The guests were moved to a different part of the um, um, water villas. They were saying they were staying. They were actually staying at a beach villa, but the beach villa area was experiencing a lot of um, their erosion plus um, their action, high direction. So this was on the eastern side of this resort, uh, but the water wheelers were on the western side. Obviously, they had to pay for the western side water wheelers, just more expensive and all that. But um, because of these warnings and all, they were able to, you know, take the resorts and the tourists to the safer locations within in that facility. So overall, this is what just one um, specific example of. How it's been done in the biggest um, you know, industry here in um, I think others may have more to add, but uh, just this um, example sprang to my mind when you just had to mention it. Can we hear from uh, Minister of Agriculture? First of all, I would like to thank uh, for this opportunity. <clears throat> 
agriculture, as you all know, is not such a, a major economic activity in Nadiz, but then our uh, policy changes and the current government is very focused on bringing an uh, economic and business uh, development in the sector as well. So, uh, this topic is uh, which we have uh, discussed and I think contributed to a lot of research activities on this topic. So uh, it is actually very beneficial for us. Our farmers uh, experience a lot of loss uh, during the flooding season and high wave uh, periods in major agricultural islands, as in the uh, in, uh, discussions and presentations by our uh, by our presenters. So I think uh, our focus will be to gather the data and uh, and to have a crop calendar based on the forecast. So that the damage will be less uh, and the economical uh, loss for the farmers will be reduced. We do have uh, insurance schemes for the farmers, but I think uh, along with the insurance schemes, if we can get the uh, weather forecast, long, uh, and uh, knowledge is uh, geographically also very unique. So from atoll to island, each atoll will be different and our forecast will be different. So I think uh, the forecasting uh, should be based on the island level and then for each island we can have a crop calendar and based on that we can arrange our seasonal crops around it. So, yeah. uh, right now we do not have any success stories because it's not uh, implemented in most of our farms. Uh, so I think this is a, a huge opportunity for us to explore this area and make use of it. And, uh, implement these changes in the I'm sure we'll, we'll get the chance to hear more of the stories from the agriculture point of view as well. How about environment? Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so um, I would like to uh, uh, develop uh, something on what Colin Kildall has mentioned about the forests. They think back on the situations. So one thing that I've uh, observed, I'm pretty sure most of us have been seeing is that um, there are um, travel uh, advisories that have been uh, that uh, still continue to be issued, and even in the past that has issued. Uh, but there are bad weather uh, going on in the Maldives, or that have been forecasted uh, to affect the Maldives. Um, travel advisories from uh, neighboring countries. The countries that uh, the meteorological officers that have uh, and a uh, with the support of the agencies that have um, issued travel advisories for uh, people who are traveling to Mondays. So I think um, in a more uh, the, in the perspective of being safe, I think it is very important that um, this has been very successful uh, in many countries. Um, but in a more economical perspective, I think it's a bit of a loss because um, um, tourists come to the country to enjoy some time and fun. But during bad weather situations, um, we're mostly advised to stay indoors and minimize activities. So um, uh, when these uh, following these travel advisories, I think the one of the best things that uh, tourists do with this is that they re reschedule their travel, they change their travel dates to uh, to a period where the weather is more uh, suitable for the activities here. So, um, in my experience and with uh, comments and uh, stories from some of my friends who have been working in two agencies, they have been um, telling that. Um, uh, tourists from uh, most countries that visit visit the visit Maldives, they give if there are bad weather indications and travel advisories related to bad weather, they change um, their uh, travel schedule to a period where it is more sunny and the weather is worse, weather is much better. Um, but in their perspective, uh, for them it feels like it's more like economic loss. But from, a, from, why, uh, from what I understand from that is, it is I think it is better for tourists to, that are coming here to enjoy themselves in much better weather rather than 
coming to the country and being stuck in Bangladesh because there have been situations where um, tourists that are in the, in, in the country and during bad weather that has affected their travel back to their country and sometimes they have to stay in the resort or uh, respective accommodation for uh, a bit longer period of time, which has not, which becomes um, not very cost effective for them, but um, it has, uh, it becomes a financial burden at some point for them. So um, I think that um, information, whether information dissemination from international agencies issuing travel uh, travel advisories has been one of the uh, one of very successful um, things that I have seen back in the past that has been uh, very advantageous to ensure that uh, people who travel to the movies do travel uh, in a period where for them is good um, and uh, to make sure that they are they do not get into trouble or face difficulties during battle yeah. um, yeah. 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 Kind of building upon what the student here have mentioned, actually, uh, something that comes to my mind is this idea or concept of position. And you've mentioned uh, island level uh, connection and whatnot, right? And it's criticality to understand the island level dynamics. Um, and I understand that with the resorts as well, you can say a whole at all or half of more is bad weather. And then all of those resorts are potentially impacted in that travel advisory mechanism, right? At the moment, what is the true precision on the ground available to us today? And what could be done to have more targeted, more specific warnings given to the tourists that would actually be impacted so that maybe we don't move or uh, bring anxiety to uh, tourists that may not have been impacted in the first place. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. um, I may actually, I would like to remind you guys to give a little bit of introduction for yourself, of yourself so that everybody else knows who and where you are present. Uh, uh, so, my name is Niels. I'm one of the directors of all these space research organizations. Yeah, thank you. Just, uh, I think the question is uh, to specify location specific focus. So currently we are using most uh, 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 global models, uh, which is as the closer resolutions of about when the so-called high resolution models are, are 9 kilometers that we get from these interviews. So we are working on to improve our local models with uh, higher resolutions. So currently we have developed wave model as it was mentioned before in the other presentations. Uh, with the less than one kilometer, but uh, atmospheric models, we have increased our HPC capacity, so we will be increasing model resolution so that we will be able to focus on locations. Uh, uh, I think I have answers to that question. So, uh, for, from the Parusha's question, I don't want to take much time because I have already taken a lot, lot of panel time, but I want to say that, that there are a lot of success stories that we have. Uh, in, in coordinations with the CBA with the events, especially with the Coast Guard, when the sea is rough, we have uh, prevented a lot of ports um, from uh, going uh, traveling. So sometimes these success stories do not come into the media, but when something happens, the, uh, the news comes uh, to the media. So the things which are prevented doesn't come. But uh, if we go, if they go against our alerts, and when something happens, these things pop up in the media and uh, the news spreads. So that's what I think. Thank you, Amber. Uh, my next question, um, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, I hope uh, I'm audible to you, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you clearly. So, um, ensuring a comprehensive coverage, which uh, again ensures a multi-hazard early warning system, which is end-to-end -end for a last mile point with a people centers one. So um, what are the strategies that can be employed to ensure early warnings are inclusive and cover all people sectors, islands, or all the hazards? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> Let me 
Uh, I thought uh, before I start uh, responding to this very specific question, uh, let me share a few important highlights uh, that came from the science. The first part, which you are all aware, uh, there is a lot of heat in the ocean, heat in atmosphere, heat in the land. Uh, and uh, as a result of the heat, uh, the disaster risk is multiplying many folds. Uh, the, the ocean heat content and sea surface temperature, these are the two key parameters uh, which moderates the risk, particularly in the Arabian Sea and in Maldives context. We had a 50 years of panel on tropical cyclone meeting in Bahrain uh, in December, and there were many exciting results that indicate or cyclone genesis change and cyclones becoming more curvatures. It is intensifying rapidly and many areas which were not directly on the cyclone tracks are becoming uh, prone to the tropical cyclone and associated depression. Maldip is one such. The best part of the SDG fund that we have implemented was we have made use of the most updated climate model, the CMIB6 which you heard the presentation, it captures the emerging and intensifying risk pertaining to Maldives. So our assessment or understanding of the risk with CMIP6 is quite precise. Now coming to your question, uh, the early warning, whether it is a multi-hazard, it's a uh, inclusive, and more importantly, it has to be science-based. It depends on the understanding of the ocean heat content and the variability of sea surface temperature. Uh, so the when we are configuring, we have to keep this science as the backbone uh, of the early warning system. Uh, I I had the opportunity to, to go through the draft roadmap and those, that roadmap captures very well how the early multi hazard early warnings should be uh, inclusive, people centered, and it can reach out to all atolls and islands of Maldives. I have just a few points from ISCAP perspective uh, from the roadmap. The first point is uh, GAP 1.1, which is there in the roadmap. Update the multi hazard risk profile. I think this project done is one of the important contribution updation of the risk profile with CMIP6. The one which I was sharing with you based on ocean heat content and sea surface temperature. The second was the digitalized map. I think this comes from this presentation. We will keep updating. You have heard our colleagues uh, the, from the Japan, UG Sans, AP Plat. We will keep updating and making these maps digital. So it will become digitalization of early warning products and services in Maldives. Gap 4.8 is the geophysical hazard tsunami. My colleagues, Tamily has informed. Colleagues, be mindful. This is one disaster which has a knockout impact on the economy. 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. 65% GDP of the Maldives were impacted. So you can see the knockout impact. So we must be prepared uh, for such disasters also in the future. And this probe, MMS is the leader. They are the secretariat of rhymes for tsunami warning system. So we have to be mindful of such disasters, which are once in hundreds of the years, but it has a implication on knockout on the economy. The GAP 2.5, uh, that is the multi-hazard early warning system. I referred panel on tropical cyclone. We have a lot of collaboration with panel on tropical cyclone. Our colleague Ali Sarif is the key member of panel on tropical cyclone. So let's make use of this panel on tropical cyclone to understand cyclone associated low depression, even the tracks which are likely to impact Maldives. And that is the source, the fundamental origin of the risk in Maldives context. So it's important to collaborate with such initiatives which has a transboundary component. The uh, final one is GAP 2.6, that is impact based forecasting. You heard many exciting experiences, including what Pragya presented with ocean wave model. This project, one of the key outcome has been to operationalize impact based forecasting 
all this depends on the digitalization. If you have a data on your platforms which are fully digital, a state of the art science based impact based forecasting is and including many sector specific Fisher minus specific impact based forecasting will be very, very useful. So with these words, I would like to conclude uh, my interventions and thank you again for giving this opportunity. We will continue our collaborations in days to come building on this project SDG fund early warning for all and all the ongoing activity at country level. So thank you colleagues for this opportunity. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay. This is Mustafa from, uh, okay. from the room. Uh, and also one question from colleagues from the MMS. Regarding the uh, impact-based forecast, I think that's, uh, of course, a very fundamental great idea to move forward. Um, what is the uh, sort of possible or expected scale of the impact that we envisage and we consider now, I mean, almost in the beginning, but the impact can be uh, defined in a very different space uh, and in different sectors, etc. I, I, uh, I think it would be useful if you can also provide your thoughts and thinking that uh, at this stage, I think in the beginning, I would say, what a scale of, of impacts, uh, considering the whole context, also including the monitoring element, which is also critical because in advance we should also do. So uh, the first question is that what a scale of impacts uh, you consider to be feasible to uh, actually measure and also forecast? That's uh, the first question. I have one more for colleagues from MMS. If you can, Dr. Sanjay, please share your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. The first is on the scale of the impact forecasting. Uh, the It also depends on the lead time. For example, if you want to have an impact forecasting maybe two, three months before, before the monsoon season or after the monsoon season, your scale of the impact forecasting will be, you know, regional, sub-regional level. Uh, what was presented under the South Asia Hydro Med Forum, SASCOF, Climate Outlook Forum, MMS is a key part of SASCOF, South Asia Climate Outlook Forum. So there the scale is all of the South Asian country. So you see all countries together with shared risk and shared vulnerability. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so for a lead time of a seasonal to sub seasonal, your scale will be much, you know, the canvas of impact forecasting will be much larger with the transboundary. But when you narrow down to the disaster which is approaching the country, uh, mostly in the case of extreme event, even for example, you take the example of uh, tides or the tropical cyclone, that is where you narrow down your impact region. Means you have to pin down which is the most uh, exposed islands or atolls impacted by the low depression or the tropical cyclone. This is where the quality of data, the granularity of data platform comes into the important. So for a cyclone or a disaster which is uh, having a lead time of let us say three to four days or in terms of few hours, the scale is exactly targeted to the people at risk, sector at risk. So these are the two approaches normally in IBF we follow. And the final one is there is a global framework of climate services WMO has been promoting. We have been doing this with South Asia Climate Outlook Forum. There are four sectors. First is people at risk, which is to be defined. Second is sector agriculture, food system, energy system, health system, water system. So these are the global framework for impact based forecasting, and those are taken into account while making impact forecasting. So our IBF approach is to follow the global framework of climate services, which encompasses the critical sector as I highlighted. But country to country, sector varies. Like in case of Maldives, our colleagues highlighted about the tourism sector, the infrastructure sector. So country to country varies, 
But global level, these are the five key sectors where impact forecasting has been a felt need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our colleagues from MMS, uh, I think yesterday also it was mentioned that I have to mention that the monitoring is a very important prerequisite for early warning. So, and uh, especially in Monday with the storms and disasters and hazards, especially, uh, how actually the quality uh, and also the, the measures in the monitoring processes, because that's ongoing. So, I think that MES services around the clock they monitor. What uh, measures sh should be taken in the monitoring processes and trends uh, to enhance and improve the early warning side? If there are anything missing from the monitoring part of the of, of the whole of the whole uh, package. Yeah, thank you for your questions. I think that is very important. Unless we do monitor uh, the weather, we will not be able to. Uh, forecast because we need to understand the current status of atmosphere yeah. uh, in order to predict what is going to happen. So monitoring only doesn't mean that it should happen over months. So we need to monitor the uh, weather around months even with the global uh, at the global scale because those uh, signals uh, coming from other I mean far away from all this actually causing the weather over this area. So our we have reasonably reasonably good observation network, but one of our challenges is to maintain those uh, stations up and running. Currently, we have 35 automatic weather stations. Uh, we are uh, trying to keep them running, but our target actually the optimum observation network uh, should have uh, 50 automatic weather stations. But we don't, at, at present we don't want to increase the number of automatic weather stations. Uh, since we have some challenges in maintaining the, the existing network, so our main target at present for a shorter few years is to keep those uh, 34 stations up and running. Uh, once we are able to keep and maintain those, we will increase to uh, ideally 50 automatic weather stations to cover all more this area. So then we will get a better representations of weather over across the country. In addition, we are uh, um, Expanding our data network uh, to cover all areas so that we also improve our monitoring capacity of uh, high impact weather systems. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, can I ask one question also for Mr. Very, very short. Yeah, yeah, very very short. Short. While you were presenting, I joined the wider group for the warning just to see what are the information. And I could see that when the clouds, like uh, that's a uh, basic piece of maps that shows the situation of the cloud that seems to be the most uh, kind of interesting for people because it has the most light or reaction. And then when the clouds are closer or they're leaving, it seems that the number of the lights, you know, increases or like the angry faces or, you know, surprise faces and all of those. So this is a good kind of a way to see that people actually see and, you know, they are responding more. But do you have any ways of kind of trying to make sure that the number of people that continue using this is increasing? Like, are they basically? Yeah, I think our uh, social media platform, I mean, the number of users are increasing their way. So, uh, especially when there are severe weather events, we promote our uh, social media platform so that more people join into the community. Uh, it has increased, I mean, I mean, in, in recent years, Recent few years, I mean, it has increased a lot. The almost right now, it's over 60, uh, 36,000 uh, basically uh, registered people. Yes. Uh, recently, I remember in one week, it was 25. Uh, I don't know if our forecasters also monitor this. I mean, 25,000. I mean, yesterday when I checked, it was 30, the updated figure I have shown. But now, mobile app has been downloaded by our. Almost 65 plus thousand people. So, uh, based on our community, I mean, population, those who are using uh, uh, this social media network, I think it is a good representation of the community. But there are areas that we are not able to reach to the because there are uh, other uh, I mean, community like uh, disabled communities. So, I mean, we need to reach reach out. So, end to end. Is to be uh, improved. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank
I'm so sorry, I'm not going to have a bit of paper because this morning is always uh, MMS actualized light. Oh, yeah, we, we see one hand. So we should give them my uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, I will be very brief, and this is just to compliment my MMS colleague. Uh, in addition to monitoring uh, the capacity of high resolve forecasting, what is called ensemble uh, modelings, which has tremendously improved, and our forecast, particularly seasonal sub seasonal forecast, which used to be you know uh, not very very authoritative, has turned authoritative. So monitoring, forecasting, modeling, put together, makes impact based forecasting more targeted, more gridded based, people centered and what you call the all inclusive. So thank you very much. These are the concluding words which I thought. I thank you. Yeah, so, just one thing. Just one. 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 Also, for the people to understand what the next steps, whenever they receive the uh, the warnings, uh, they, they need to know what the next steps are. We we call it impact based forecasting, or I think any other fancy names. I think it's it's key that um, when when the warning reaches, for you to you know truly be um, end to end, um, we, we we really need the person who receives the warning to know what he or she should do uh, as, as a person, as the community, um, you know, to ensure that the res resilience is clear. Um, be it, you know, putting sand um, um, bags in front of their door, or, or you know, community level actions. I think that is sometimes missing, and that will, will definitely, that was one of the key focus of the roadmaps, and, I think I'm really happy that it's being um, done, you know, attended to, and um, yeah, just wanted to highlight. Thank you very much. Uh, because actually, I was uh, going to come to that uh, to discuss a little bit about the depth, but then, uh, we already have started the discussion. Well, um, actually, from my uh, 10 years experience in disaster management, actually, uh, I often feel that one of the most critical gap is uh, that we. It's actually open the challenge of ensuring effective communication and understanding. That's one thing that I uh, understood in my campaign area. So, actually, um, I would like to know from a sectoral perspective, not from the early warning or methodological perspective, but from a sectoral perspective, um, what are the potential uh, gaps in the current early warning systems that is being challenging for your sector, particularly in the environment? And also, um, I would like to ask. Of Fizal, because uh, we have been working on the uh, roadmap. So, uh, during the more roadmap development, uh, what what was the most critical gap? Maybe one or two gaps that uh, you understood in this early warning systems that needs urgent attention. I know there is a lot of gaps. There is a lot of gaps, but then one or two which needs urgent uh, attention in uh, this early warning world. Maybe we can start with these sectors and then we'll come back to you. Um, major gaps, I think, uh, um, but challenges we face due to these are that uh, our plants get more prone to the diseases, pest and diseases, diseases, which affects our cultivation. So um, we we also are looking into it uh, how we can manage it by using uh, certain plants as wind shields in between the cropping uh, in, in the fields and. Um, that is one of the major challenges that we have faced after a, you know, a change in climate or after flooding or high tide. And uh, salt intrusion into our fields have, uh, is also one of the major things that is uh, leading uh, to a decrease in the cultivation um, during the, our seasonal cropping seasons. I think uh, maybe a technological based application uh, uh, has to be tied with the agricultural cropping, especially uh, with the crops that we uh, buy our watermelon uh, and uh, the crops which are in the food security uh, uh, would be for our sector uh, uh, climate change. Uh, 
Um, so from a climate change perspective, um, there are two gaps. One of the things would be um, strengthening uh, policies and regulations is one of the areas um, locally focus on and um, enforcement and implementation as well. And when we talk about implementation, we, I think I'm sure everybody here will talk about funding, funding arrangements, technology transfer, and uh, all these kinds of things. But mostly it's um, uh, funding security, I would say. And uh, uh, pretty sure most people here would agree that um, uh, most of the work done is uh, based on uh, climate and environment work and um, even agriculture as well. And many of the sectors, we have uh, a lot of the, our work is uh, based on donor funding and grants. So, and uh, one of the key challenges in that is that um, nationally allocated budget for uh, much needed work like this is um, not actually sufficient, and we depend on donor. Uh, donor funding and grants in order to carry out this work. And it, um, it's, it's, it kind of um, it delays um, a bit more than um, uh, more than a lot of time, uh, which actually um, we, when we have a plan and when we execute the plan, uh, we feel that sometimes when we, when we rely on donor funded grants, it, it delays a lot of the work which we do. Um, so um, I think it, it, in order to address this gap, there needs to be a way or a mechanism that local funding or national funding can be uh, arranged within the government for the kind of work that all sectors are doing in, in climate adaptation and resilience and disaster management and so on and so on. So I think I, I, I see that this is one of the bigger gaps that have been identified. And, uh, in order to improve or to close the gap, um, there should be uh, local arrangements or local allocations uh, assigning funding to the work which we are doing. Thanks. I think, uh, like uh, our colleague from the Environment Ministry just mentioned, finance is a key gap, but I'll just take a step back and look at the, I, I think, uh, from the bigger picture perspective. Um, I feel like there's also a major need for um, synergizing um, across the government as well as the private sector. So often do we see um, duplication of efforts um, in several areas. And um, this, this is not intentional, of course, I mean, but um, I think this can be uh, reduced uh, minimized to ensure that um, you know there, there is there are institutions um, you know looking at ensuring that minimal duplication and that, you know these efforts need to need to like gentleman mentioned the needs to come from the government and it needs to be uh, monitored throughout uh, what the what the uh, projects are uh, on certain areas uh, who is doing what and you know what's ending when all this so i think that's one of the key key things of course finance is a problem but um too often we see not only in Maldives, but in even in other countries but it's it's uh, it's an issue that we have uh, here as well thank you so um we have a question from we know we are living in an era of technology so everything is based on technology no doubt the technological advancements are paramount for early mornings, providing faster and more accurate data collection, analysis, and dissemination as well. And these technological innovations actually uh, enable the sweet responses to political threats and significantly enhance the effectiveness of early warning systems as well. So um, I would like to um, ask Ahmed Rashid from the Digital Services um, on your experience and uh, your expertise. What role do these technological advancements play in improving the capabilities of the early warning systems 
And how can uh, innovation be leveraged to enhance this accuracy and speed of our design? Yeah, thank you for that. I think I have covered some of the parts in my presentations, but uh, just to repeat, uh, uh, currently, I mean, I think the most modern technology of disseminating the world is common design protocol. So we have already implemented, we are using it. But there are other technological approaches that we can have to disseminate uh, to reach a bigger community uh, to end, end to end early warning systems. Uh, so, as the new technology that in advanced countries use uh, cell broadcasting to disseminate early warning systems. And also, we are working with uh, NDMA and BSM uh, early warning broadcasting system that will disseminate uh, the alerts. To the household when when the television sets. So these are some of the techniques that we can uh, use uh, to improve to enhance our uh, the only dissemination, especially when it comes to dissemination point. Um, so we all know also the stakeholder coordination and collaboration in early warning systems is the most important thing to ensure unified and efficient response to potential hazards. I can see that um, we have some other sectors as well. Uh, we have other sectors here as well um, who is um, working on uh, response as well. So um, before I go to that question, because I started the <laughs> talk, um, I would like to view an maybe give an introduction before your question. Hi, my name is Ulfa. I work at the Special World. I had a very specific question to Amanda, and I saw on the, on the presentation that we are trying to operationalize um, and use lost database um, and adapt. Um, I want to see what the timelines for it are and your thoughts on the scope of the, how the swarm settlements and extreme events can be integrated into this database and will it be accessible to the part of the yeah, it was a requirement from the roadmap that uh, Pizal was uh, mentioned. So under that roadmap, the requirement came from MDMA. So MDMA will be working on it. So it will be the timeline of MDMA, but DCF project will support to implement those activities. And I mean, uh, the track project will support MDMA to develop. So it will be on the timeline of MDMA. So the requirement came from MDMA. To it's uh, still on the process uh, of development, so we'll be more than happy to share as it progress with the other people as well. That could be my answer. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, going back, oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Just one more question because we talked about the fine based forecast and so forth, and then we look at the alert uh, right now, and then uh, somebody was mentioning that how specific are the alerts, how they they are they are advised uh, you know in a smarter way so that they can take the steps and steps forward to actually uh, protect themselves. So uh, do you have any plan to include impact based forecasting in your alerts anytime soon? Okay. Uh, I mean for the for the the social media the way you Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we are working with the assistance from USA project. Uh, actually, the, our bottleneck at present is uh, we don't have enough uh, model resolutions. I mean, we are using a closer resolution models that can resolve a local level impact. So once we are able to improve our modeling capacity, uh, which is ongoing process, now we got a high performance computing system. So once we install the model and start running a high uh, high resolution model, we will be able to overlay on what existing one SDG has uh, done a lot of things. So we will be able to use those things uh, to overlay higher resolution modeling on, on what is the existing platforms. So that will improve the localized, more localized uh, IBM impact by forecasting. Thank you. So uh, going back to what you were talking about, stakeholders and collaboration. Um, other than environment and agriculture, I see some of other organizations, NGOs, and other uh, partners here. So um, we have been talking about gaps and challenges a lot. So I, I would actually um, like to know what are the opportunities actually uh, based on your experiences or maybe observed by some of our international partners here. What are these uh, opportunities um, in coordinating efforts uh, across various organizations in terms of early warning? 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, for example, in Maldives, we have a very dispersed population living all across throughout the country. Um, and we have the offices mainly based in Mali. So uh, when we talk about disaster risk knowledge, especially, and this applies to all four pillars as well, um, I think it's crucial that we understand, we, we, we look at it from uh, the perspective of the, the inhabitants of these islands. Um, to understand that they understand their island better than someone coming from outside and telling them you know, what the hazards would be. So, um, this practice of uh, looking, you know, going to the islands and actually asking them, asking the um, you know, NGOs, events groups, community based organizations, what the risks are, for us, what the risks of the, uh, you know, experienced in the islands. I think that is key to you know, building that understanding of the existing. Uh, we you know, scientific terminology like hydrodynamics or you know, the coastal geomorphology as well. So I think it's crucial that um, that connection with the communities is established as well. Um, you know, yes, of course, the, the data, the scientific data on the Geo, geophysical environments key, but at the same time, um, the knowledge from the people. Um, if you look at, for example, events that have a long return period, um, we go to an island and we do some work there, research. You will not, you will not get that high return period hazards um, within that, you know, few weeks you are there doing your service. But you will get this data from the people. They will talk about this data. They will talk about 10 years ago, they had this, this and that. And you understand this every 10 years. There has been an experience from the locals that this is happening every 10 years. So that kind of data, you can, your, your equipment cannot really capture. It's, it's that, that needs to come from the people and needs to be integrated. Any other organization or such a move away on this scientific and awards opportunities, right? Do we have in collaboration, coordination among organizations? I have a comment, and I think there are a lot of preconceived biases on the role of an NGO, and that has been a challenge for us. Uh, um, Whenever we like the signal seems to be that unless we are a private entity offering a service, there is no real place for us to provide a technical input, uh, especially in a project form of engineering. We are brought in maybe once every six or so months to give some feedback, but like is that enough? Um, I don't think it's enough. So uh, there isn't really that mechanism that we feel for facilitating that dialogue. You know, Maybe any other organization who won't be in these organizations. I uh, know. <laughs> okay. So um moving on. I think it's important that we talk about this um best practices, uh educational practices when we talk about our reform. So um that's Sunday is here. We would like to know from you some of the best practices from a global perspective uh, that can be maybe applied to the Maldives and how can international collaboration that you understand in the local early world sectors? Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, I will just flag two very um, uh, important uh, experiences in the recent times, uh, I think which could form the basis of a good practices. You know, in uh, I just want to cite the examples what happened in Thailand of 2004 tsunami. Uh, the largest casualty was the casualty of the tourists, particularly the European tourists from the Sweden, and that is how they contributed a lot of uh, money to escape multi donor trust fund. So the another example, 2017 cyclone Ochi. Cyclone was predicted with a very high level of accuracy, lead time, intensity, impact, everything. Uh, but despite all this, 143 fishermen died in the, the, the Kerala coast. 
So your forecast could be very precise, but if it is targeted uh, to your tourist, like what happened in Thailand, the fisherman, what happened in Kerala, uh, then it will have a life saving impact. So we need to understand the early warning requirements for different segment of the populations, the people, whether it's the tourist, fisherman, uh, the, the gender and other vulnerable group. So the best practice that exists today is you have uh, the app, uh, you have the mechanism to popularize such practices which are targeted to the person or to the community at risk. So targeting is one where technology plays an important role. Early warning for all is all about the collaborations across the UN system, across the countries, and with multiple stakeholders. You saw uh, the global lead doesn't mean that it is only the lead of UN agency who is going to work on impact forecasting. It's everybody is together. The cell broadcasting, my colleagues highlighted so well, the common alert protocols, uh, because you know, the uh, pillar one is uh, to inform, inform about the knowledge, inform about the science, inform about the risk. Pillar two is to act on that information. You warn, you forecast. And then it comes to pillar three, you have to act on, uh, communicate <coughs> that risk with technology and then the end <coughs> to respond. So this is a, a cycle. Any gap in the cycle will lead to failure of the early warning system. So the best practice that happens today in different part of the world is put everything together, the knowledge to warn, to inform and to respond. So in whichever context, this cycle, the closed loop, is well in place institutionally by building the capacity and knowledge. I think that has really made a lot of difference worldwide. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjay. Do you have any other questions? I don't see it. Anyway, uh, moving on, uh, we know when it comes to implementation, that's the hard job. We it a project initiative or even standards or guidelines. It, the hard part is always the implementation part. So I would like to know from um, maybe from amendment and uh, any other one who want to um, contribute. Well, what are these possible challenges that we face, um, especially to ensure an end-to-end -end early warning uh, mechanism in model, um, especially reaching out to the last uh, mile person? So what, what what are the challenges? Why why is this not happening? This is an open question for anyone who wants to uh, put your experience on. I can. Uh, so, I uh, think if Shamil was here, he would have loved to say about this. Uh, but yeah, um, um, Pillar 4 looks at the um, end, you know, making sure we speak, the message reaches to the last mile. Uh, and one of the key areas of that. You know, in Pillar 4, they highlighted this, uh, making sure the message goes to everyone, everyone in Maldives, um, not just the locals. Um, a lot of um, the Maldives, uh, people living in Maldives are expat workers um, who don't speak the, the Maldivian language. I mean, who don't, who speak the Maldivian language, they often are not able to um, read and write Tibeti or English, but uh, yes, many of them can. Um, most of them are not, and and this is a major limitation. And um, because of that, um, on the on the um, roadmap, um, it, they mentioned in pillar four that there is going to be warning messages being translated to three languages, if I remember correctly. Um, three commonly used, uh, most commonly used languages by expat workers in Maldives. To ensure that it reaches them as well and on time, and to ensure that actions are taken by them as well. Because um, often this conversation, we, we often forget we don't include um, is this, and um, we, we need to include the expat workers and who are often marginalized 
and, and we, we need to ensure that this message reaches them and it's an approved as well. Um, I think we would also like to hear from fisheries and agriculture because it's one of the critical sectors of where fishermen and agriculture is most uh, are, are most hit during any severe weather events. And uh, in my experience, of course, agriculture crops is one of the hard hit area uh, during a disaster. So um, what, what are the challenges that these uh, farmers face on this area? Uh, we understand that um, in critical services has a viable app, they have most of that. There's a lot of ways that they can actually get this alert messages. Irrespective of that, what is the challenge that these uh, farmers are having on this area with the early world for all this? I think uh, from my experience, I think uh, I have uh, almost 10 years of experience in agriculture. Thing. So uh, farmers are usually not aware of these things when they are starting their cropping calendar. Uh, I think uh, uh, most of our farmers, uh, uh, I'm not talking about there are two or three farmers who have uh, uh, adopted uh, smart technological farming methods. Uh, they might have, uh, you know, reduced the waste that uh, they incur losses during farming due to uh, climate changes. But most of our local uh, <clears throat> farmers, they they don't see the weather, even though they we receive alerts from uh, from the organizations, but they don't check it. And uh, once the cropping is lost, when the plants are lost, we get a lot of complaints from the farmers that. They, oh, oh, uh, I think, uh, especially during Ramadan season, if there is any uh, climate change or if there's a heavy pour or high tide during that uh, time, all of the whatever they have been planting or planting throughout the year, they would have lost it. So uh, during uh, for the first three uh, initial six months of the year, they will not have any profit from that. So uh, over the years, a lot of complaints we have received through this. So uh, right now we are just, uh, you know, trying to figure out how we can have a sort of climate smart agricultural technologies incorporated into the uh, usual farming methods. I think more awareness sessions to the farmers to get aware of it, to have proper planning of it, you know, may, may, uh, we will have uh, solutions based on these things, but yes, uh, we get a lot of uh, complaints, a lot of uh, frustrations from the farmers when they are in business. And when this affect uh, their entire uh, season, uh, cropping season will be affected. And uh, usually three or four cropping uh, seasons, they will have planned for the entire year. And if there are high tide or uh, for Heavy four uh, during the three or four two quarters, then the entire uh, eight year will be affected. So I think uh, the damage is very high due to this. So I think uh, proper planning, proper awareness, and I think uh, something also my colleagues have uh, addressed the budgeting challenges and uh, duplication of efforts. I think all this we have to have a combined effort from all the organization and ministries. Is there any advice that you give from the agriculture department to the farmers uh, apart from the alerts they get they get from the tech services? No, not as of now. We don't have it, but yes, uh, we have a lot of new policies since uh, we are our now uh previously we were ministry of fisheries and agriculture. Now it's just ministry of agriculture. So our focus on policies will be more in the budget that we uh We'll get on agriculture. So our plans and policies will be implemented according to the changes that we have passed over the years and how to overcome. I have a follow up question to that as well. Um, because there was a mention on uh, loss and insurance. Yeah. Um, for the insurance to be kicked in, are there any prerequisites or pre actions that are planned, or is their policy being developed? That certain actions need to be taken in accordance to the warnings in order to be eligible for uh, insurance. Uh, um, we have insurance schemes, I think, for the plastic sales, but it doesn't really work over because the farmers are a little bit hesitant to pay the preliminary amount. So right now we are just you know brainstorming over how we could 
uh, engage more farmers into these insurance schemes, how we can uh, provide a little bit more benefit and create awareness on how this will actually benefit when they pay. So yes, uh, policy discussions are being uh, very tight now. Just um, I don't know that uh, regarding this transfer and um, insurance. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Maldives do have very um, interesting kind of um, insurance packages uh, provided by them. Right? If you go through them with a very uh, small premium, they have like uh, 200 NBR per year, and where you can actually insure um, your rented um, belongings as well. So they have everything is very much customized. Um, I think we need a little bit more awareness on um, these insurance policies to uh, save our, you know, belongings, be it agriculture or your house, or um, especially for the people who live on rent in Mali, where you don't own a house, but you have your furniture, your electronic items, that could actually be um, insured as well. So I think we need more um, awareness on this aspect for uh, to promote a risk transfer mechanism in Mali's as well. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So, uh, as we are running out of time, we are already late. Um, I see her yep, Yeah, just one comment. I think, I think the, the last few days, we've heard so much about so many different initiatives from so many different organizations on the early warning system. So, I think that one of the key takeaways is that as the government, you know, the, the efforts are usually coming into you all, and then you have all these development partners and others. And there's a ton of pilot studies and things, but at some point making a call to say, okay, this is the structure in which we think is most effective to create an empty early warning system. And now funds should go to bolster that instead of to continue to selectively choose islands that get a new early warning system or a new based on who the donor is. And so I think and I think that the development community also has to hold themselves accountable to coordinating better across. But I think oftentimes it's NDMA or MMS who the funds are coming to from different parties. And so you're just helping us to stay in line and say, okay, this is happening, so don't do this or contribute to this or, you know, sort of bring up this to, to really reach everyone by the end. Thank you very much, Carol. So, um, yes, as I said, we're running out of time. Um, do we have any questions in the chat? No, I okay. There are no questions. Do we have any questions from I can see three hands. <laughs> we start with Mustafa, uh, from you, and then we go to you. So three questions. Yeah, thank you much. You just sharing the piece of experience from other contexts. I think uh, both in southern Amsterdam as well as disasters, the distinction between the public early warning, which is going to be public uh, authorities and sponsor organizations. And also the, the state of emergency, I think that helps. So because people are not individually react to any early warning every day, they don't actually forecast. Uh, I think here, for example, then we have many times very, very good the growth. And then in the context that education, awareness, raising information sharing, you mentioned, I think, on health law. So there is an understanding that the general early warning will require precautionary measures for various sectors, government, and public authorities. And then what is the difference between that and then the state of emergency that any individual should, should actually be aware and alert to take action? And then the training, uh, also the other skills can be added to that, just as thought. Thank you very much. So it's more of a comment than a question. Um, but I've worked a bit on early warning systems uh, um, what I've noticed is usually when implementing early warning systems, this uh, information about false positives or false negatives something's really quite key to be able to understand. So if, if, if a warning goes out and doesn't happen, keep and false warnings keep going up, then when an actual warning happens, there's going to be less um, reaction, there's going to be less people taking action. What I've noticed with the conversation says there hasn't been a lot of uh, focus on how a warning should be communicated, whether people on our islands would understand if the uncertainty of probabilities would be included to understand how the probabilities of this happen. So I think there needs to be a bit more research on how warnings should be communicated 
in a way that people understand it better, a way that people can take action better. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks a lot. I'm from a local council, uh, from Monitor Marco. I would like to uh, mention that uh, since we are from uh, Echoes and Islands, uh, I think uh, we can still uh, minimize the gap if we uh, have some uh, better awareness and understanding about uh, to which agency at which time we can be contacting and we can be approaching in 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 a time we have to since in our islands we have farmers we have uh, uh, people who work in uh, on uh, the tourism sector and fish, fishing and everything and the one thing that i would like to uh, mention is that uh, is there any uh, is there or do we have proper instructions and policies and SOPs that we can go and communicate with our communities this is how you have to come and approach this is how we can approach because uh, it seems that in islands and in echoes since we are also going towards our digitization and we would like to know how we can align with the government policies and what are the common things that we can do with you guys since we are with the peoples in the islands and we should i think we really we should know how to approach you and which what are the channels and what are the ways that we can go on in, in case if sometimes we if we get an alert uh, we I, I believe we should know at, at the very first moment to whom we have to contact to whom we have to inform because since we consider an island and uh, island communities we have police or any nearby island we may have uh, let's say an MLA post or, or anything like that so we, I have found that in recent years, since I have also experienced some cases, um, there are some misunderstandings, maybe not 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 intentional all the times. But to minimize those gaps, I think uh, clear instructions and uh, information need to be you know, transferred to the islands and communities, mostly the people who are leading in the islands. That's what I just. Yeah, thank you for your questions. I think the main issue, uh, as an agency, we have all the SOPs procedures. I think the main issue is the awareness component. So that that is lagging even in agriculture is highlighted even in the island councils, the awareness issues. Uh, we have been conducting monsoon forums at different regions of the country in central, uh, southern, northern, but I think in known area, we have not conducted any monsoon forum. So these are the platforms that we share the information, how they can reach out I and mean, how uh, best they can utilize our forecast, our terminologies, what what technical terminologies to uh, I mean to bring into the demands language. So that is an area that we need to improve. Uh, regarding the actions, I think uh, EM plans uh can highlight it, how when an alert is received uh, a DM plan should act, uh, island disaster management plan uh, should get activated. So those actions uh, will be highlighted in the disaster management plan which is uh, in the next okay. uh, Because we don't have time very, very briefly, I think I can uh, tell you on uh, the mechanism right now that we have. Um, we actually um, have yearly um, meetings with federal councils because there's 180 plus islands. It's, uh, um, impossible for us to have meetings with specific islands. So we, we go with um, at all, and then we invite all the island councils to join that same meeting. So we had one last year um, where we explained how, we, how, I mean, how to report incidents, what are the actions to take, and the whole procedure of you know communicating to NDMA. Uh, we are very easily reachable at any point of time. We have one month file. So you can just give us a call at any time um, if there is an incident. And I'll be more than happy to give you, uh, you know, a little bit detailed version of how we work with the uh, councils. We uh, promote a very much decentralized mechanism. We work, uh, all our projects and programs are community-based. So which means we, we work with the communities as well. So maybe if we haven't got in touch yet, this is an opportunity where I can, I can introduce you to our staff and then Maybe take it forward from there. Maybe after this session, we'll go ahead with that. 
So I, I'm sorry, we already took 10 minutes of the discussion. Thank you so much. I mean, we already knew that this is going to be a popular webinar session. Yeah, more of yeah, yeah, just before, before uh, we conclude, I think this would be nice. Um, if I can give like 30 seconds for all the panelists to say, to say a closing yeah. remark. Sir? So the, the next panel is waiting. Oh, they are already waiting. So just take 30 seconds, please. 30 seconds yeah. for your closing remarks. I think I'll be very quick. I think the coherence between the institutions is key um, to make, make sure that this works. And uh, like the gentleman mentioned, I think it's very important and we get more than that. Um, <laughs> it's very important that uh, the, the messages reach everyone and um, it's going to, you know, going to be as effective as possible. In short, as the discussion so, uh, went on, I mean, the most uh, pressing one is, I think, like for awareness, I think we need to uh, enhance the, uh, I mean, increase the awareness sessions to the community so that they can best utilize the information that is being disseminated. I think uh, the policy changes on the sector on awareness, on the, uh, coordination, organizing, and decentralizing the way the infrastructure. Thank you. So in support of uh, all the panelists here and uh, all the work that we have been um, doing in early morning, the road fund has been established. Um, early morning is very bright for us ahead in the future. And there are still a lot of areas where we can explore on collaboration with um, other partner agencies and NGOs and other companies. So we have a bright future ahead and we, uh, we plan to take this initiative further for it to be success, successful and effective in Maldives. Yeah, thank you. My first point starts the leadership of Maldives through SCAP Commission session, climate action in Asia Pacific, where uh, the early warning for all is the key component. Maldives, Fiji, a small island brought SCAP in into early warning for all game. My second point is Maldives is the first country who has started early warning for all pilot. It's a great. My third point is Maldives is the country where slow onset and extreme event, including tsunami, are something which you cannot see in very near future, but in long term, these are the very critical risk which we need to be prepared for. Early warning for all provides that opportunity to prepare Maldives for slow onset, climate event, and also for tsunami. So let's make use of early warning for all as a real opportunity to build resilient future of Maldives. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to finish off this session, let's carry forward this uh, momentum and trend that our collaborative efforts, our community evolve in a way that ultimately contribute to safety and resilience of the world. Thank you for your engagement and uh, dedication for this session. It has been a wonderful session so far. Let's close the session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to cut a break by five minutes. You still have 15 minutes. But let's all just go grab something really quick and be back here right and right at 11 o'clock.